Different knives. Um, different from your kit. You have a slicer knife. I have a scimitar. The slicer you have is similar to this one. Uh, it's a good knife. I would suggest using this for a lot of your uh, meat cutting. It's excellent for trimming. It's thin. It's not really thick like your chef knife. All right, so it enables you to slice easily. I use the scimitar. If you have one, you can certainly bring it to class. Um, let's see, what else? I have boning knives. Uh, I use a six inch stiff boning knife. I have a six inch flexible boning knife. Yours is um, more like this knife, I believe, except it's not curved up. Um, yours also has a little slope to it. In other words, right in here on the bolster, it's got like a slope situation so you can hold up on the blade a little bit, which is a good way to hold your knife like this. Like you're shaking somebody's hand like you mean it. All right? Um, don't hold your knife like this. That's how you would, I don't know what you would do, calligraphy. All right, don't do calligraphy. Don't hold your knife way back here. Not that I have anything against calligraphy, I think it's kind of cool, but don't hold your knife like that. The other way is to hold your knife like this, and this is for when you're doing serious uh, boning techniques, all right? And you would see butchers hold their knives like this, and sometimes they'll reverse. I don't want you to do this, all right? Um, you can do that when you're with much more experienced with your knife, but I don't want you to do that here. It can result in some serious injuries. All right. Um, let's see what else. Um, one of the things is when you're cutting, sometimes you're flattening your knife out like this and uh, providing a little bit of flex to it. So I'll put my thumb actually on the knife and flex the knife a little bit. Like that. This is a five-inch uh, shorty, excellent poultry knife. Nice and small, I can choke up on it. Almost like a paring knife, but with a big handle. The problem with a paring knife is the handle is way too small. To me, uh, the knife handle is almost as important as the blade. If you notice, I got all these cheap plastic handled knives. This one is my favorite. It's like a mountain bike grip. I like it. Um, this one is a Velo Cheapo Dexter. This one also has a nice grip to it. I like that texturized feel. Um, sometimes I find the hard ebony knives, like the ones that you have, if they get wet or they get greasy, they're very slippery. But that's just my own feeling. Um, you know, as far as the steel is concerned, uh, make sure that you keep them nice and sharp. Um, you know, work on your work on your edge. Uh, throughout the week, there is a day that I will pick that I will grade your knives. All right, I will test them for sharpness. Um, I don't know if you got a knife sharpening demo or not, did you? Mm -hmm. Knife sharpening demo, make sure that you keep your knives sharp. Um, uh, and then if you're gonna steal your knife, you just hold the steel up like so, swipe down one way, then down the other way. One, two, one, two, one, two. I go like that. Sometimes I go like this. I don't think it really matters which direction you go. Some people say it does. But I'm a butcher. What am I trying to do when I do that? I'm trying to shine that edge up. I'm trying to shine it back into perfection. All right. So I'm applying a little bit of pressure and swiping back and forth, trying to get it clean. All right. When I say clean, if I look at this edge with a black background, I don't see any silver spots. I don't see any flat spots on it. You know, I look down at it and it's a clean edge. All right. So that's that's some of the things I'll be looking for. All right. Let's get to this. This is uh, the beef round. You can see this one was inspected by the USDA. Inspected and passed. Woo. Uh, 4477 tells me that it's Myler's. That's his number. Um, in the industry, that, that would tell you what plant it came from and give you a sense of traceability back to uh, wherever this came from in case there was any sort of uh, contamination that we had to worry about. Um, let's see, what else about this? This exterior layer is the subcutaneous fat. It's the fat just under the skin. 
All right, you can see it's sliceable. Uh, that's a good sign. Um, you know, that's basically that type of fat would be the exterior fat. On the other side, you see this fat here. This is the interior fat. Notice the difference. It's a hard, crumbly fat. You couldn't slice this very easily. Um, that's the fat that would be considered the kidney pelvic heart fat or the lumbar fat. All right? uh, then you see this here, fat between the lean muscle. That's the intermuscular fat. And then you see also some marbling. Right, this one's got nice marbling. You see that? Oof. Good stuff. Now, this piece of beef has been aging for about 10 days, maybe a little bit longer than that. Probably getting close to two weeks. Um, it's been just exposed to the air. Um, meat will start to discolor as it ages. Um, it, the, the myoglobin within it starts to oxidize. All right, myoglobin is oxidized. This uh, was raised uh, locally. It was fed on grass and then finished on some grain. It's, you can see that it has um, a little bit of a yellowish tinge to the fat until I cut into it a little bit. And even then, a slight yellowing tells you that this animal uh, was eating on grass. All, all cattle eat grass, even any commercially raised cattle will be eating grass for a time. Um, and then they're switched over to a ration. A ration would be a grain, a grain and roughage mixture. All right? And that roughage is usually hay. So there's no straight grain fed animals, uh, uh, beef animals out there. They're always fed a mixture of uh, grain and hay. Alright, as far as bone structure is concerned, I'm just doing a little trimming here. Um, this bone right here is the H bone, and then from the H bone up into here is the femur bone, and then from here to here is the shank, and then over here in the corner is the kneecap. That's what's in here. Alright, so um, first things first. We're going to uh, take off the shank. I'm just trimming some of this stuff off. A lot of times these would be hanging on, on hooks. Like I said, that's where we're, why I wear the helmet. And you would break it down off the hook. If you watch any of the videos, like the Buckhead Beef videos that were suggested for this class, you'll see uh, they're cutting everything down off of hooks. So it's a little bit different than what I'm going to do. I'm going to start over here on the shank. Tomorrow you're going to bone out beef shanks. First thing I'll do is take off this. This is called the gambrel cord. Uh, it's like the Achilles tendon. You cut through that. They actually sell this. There's a lot of Asian markets want this. This is pure collagen. What happens when I moist cook this? When I turn this into a soup? It melts down and adds a lot of gelatin into the water, right? Tasty. Does it have flavor? You bet. Then what I'm doing here is I'm working into this natural seam. And I'll spin it around so you can see. So there's lots of lower end choice. And then you get into select. That would be the next level down. And then you have what's called no roll. No roll would be not graded because it's really low quality. Most of your older, like dairy cows, would be no roll. Do they end up as meat? Why, yes, they do. And then you have them your way. <laughs> There's a little hole in the pelvic bone here. I go around that just to free this up. And then I'm going to cut across the back of the H-bone, and we'll talk about the cuts that are in here. 
This is called bench breaking. In other words, you're boning this out on the bench as opposed to off a hook, which is, you know, ancient history. Or it's the way that you would do it in a restaurant because you don't have a hook. A lot of the uh, meat processors would have tons of equipment. Some of them would be uh, hydraulic hooks that you would hook to the floor and with a cable and you'd press a button with your foot and it would pull this down for you so you wouldn't have to do it by hand. Other things would be all the protective gear that you would wear. There would be a lot of uh, like chain mail. You'd wear a chain mail apron. You'd have wrist guards, Kevlar gloves a lot of times. And a lot of times you'd be using a, a hook to do this stuff. Like the way I'm pulling with this other hand, I have a, a meat hook. Which I do have one in there, but I just... I'm, I'm kind of trying to show you the way it would be done if you're not in a meat processing plant, if you're in a restaurant set. You know? You're not going to work in a meat processing plant, I don't think so. So, why not show the way you would do it in a restaurant? This is called the pelvic bone, or H-bone, part of the pelvic bone. Next, um, we have the femur bone in here. And we're going to put all these cuts up back on this cart, and we're going to leave them overnight. And then tomorrow we're going to take these and we're going to divide them and turn them all into roasts. All right, so there's not going to be much production for this first day. enables me to grab and make my cuts. What I'm looking for is a natural seam between the top round and the bottom round, basically. And as I cut down, that seam will just start to open. See how that just opens up. trying not to cut into any of the other cuts that are on the other side because that would damage them. cuts kind of are always the same because of the natural separations of the muscles. That piece that I just took off, that's called the top round or inside round. It's the inside part of the leg. Top round or inside round. What's this piece? That's the shank. So, so far we have the shank and the top round. Next up, well, we'll finish on this uh, 
femur bone. In here, you're going to see the, the kneecap, and this cut is called the, uh, the knuckle. If everything goes well, we can push all this off. I'm creating what? A, a bone seam, so to speak. See how that's peeling off? So clean. Basically, do the same thing you're going to do when you're going out your leg of lamb. We're together right to the break. Woo! We can talk about Christmas dinner and New Year's <laughs> dinner and all these fancy dinners. New Year's Eve extravaganza. <laughs> we'll do a steamship roast. What would that be? That's when we roast this entire thing. We take the shank and French it off. Take out the H bone and then roast this giant. What a carving station that would be. Put a little party hat on it, you know. Yes, give us all your money. <laughs> What's the big day throughout the year? Um, New Year's? What's another one? Valentine's Day? Mother's Day. Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Yeah. Those three days. You make all your money. <laughs> They're spaced perfectly to get you out of debt. <laughs> 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 New Year's comes right at the end of the year. It's like, whew. <laughs> Pay all the bills off at the end of the year. Valentine's Day, it's like the middle of winter. Perfectly timed. Thank goodness. <laughs> and then Mother's Day, just when you need to buy new equipment for the summer. <laughs> but there's lots of other little holidays. Thanksgiving can be a good one. <laughs> That's what. Your femur bone. Inside, from here to there, is where you're going to find marrow. All right? Marrow is um, soft, uh, kind of buttery, a little fatty. Marrow, marrow is loaded with flavor. So marrow bones go for a lot more money than just regular uh, beef bones. The ends of these bones would also be very good for stock. There's lots of connective tissue on there. So those bones are good for stock. This bone would be okay for stock. It's got connectives on it. There's a little bit of fluid around the knee. That's typical. Um, that's called synovial fluid. And if there's an excess of it, it might mean the animal was injured, but a little bit of it is normal. Um, it's the lubrication around the knee. All right, so don't be grossed out by it. Or you can do that's fine. It's very slippery. Put it on your elbow. <laughs> elbow grease. <laughs> um, this is now the knuckle. Um, and this one was exposed to the air um, for a few days, so I'm going to trim off the exterior of it. You can see how it's discolored a little. This meat was never in a plastic, which is a rarity today. Most meat comes in a plastic, which would stop all of this oxidation, of course, since there's no oxygen. So that's, you know, meat in a plastic bag is definitely preserved. Um, there's natural seams here, pulling off some of these little extra side muscle pieces.
this we'll deal with tomorrow. Scare it off a little bit. Nice. And this would be what you would call a trim knuckle. Actually, it would take off the exterior before they package it. This becomes what? Yeah, it becomes my usable trim. So what do I do with my usable trim? I can grind it, right? Why would I grind my own beef in-house? So you could say you grind your own beef. Right, I would, I would definitely put that on the menu. We grind our own beef. We select the finest cuts of the round. In other words, our usable trim. <laughs> but no, but for real, I mean, uh, you could buy these cuts if they're reasonable enough and just grind them and put on there, we do, we select whole muscle cuts and we grind. But I could also take these little trim pieces. Um, let's talk about grain. You can see the muscle fibers of this, right? You see the grain? If I was to uh, cut this into a portion, I would be cutting across the grain, right? Like that, breaking the muscle fibers. All right, making it a much more tender piece. Um, if I was going to cut this into stew, say to speak, or kebab, I could cut it with the grain, creating my strips, and then cross-cutting it into my little portion cube, whatever size I'm looking for. All right, that's a pretty small cube of meat, but. You know, maybe I'm doing a little beef barley soup with some cremini mushrooms or something like that. Nice little sherry in there. Made my hearty beef stock out of what? Nose to tail menu. We take everything, we use every part of it, right? So our usable trim now, and all of this, I can cut that, cut that all goes into my cremini mushroom beef barley soup, which is $9 a ball. <laughs> Don't be afraid to charge. Now this piece, this is called the gooseneck. All right, I don't know where the name came from, but I guess it's this end of it, looks like a gooseneck. Um, it is actually three parts, all right? So far we have the top round, the knuckle, the shank. What are the last three parts? Eye round. Bottom round, eye round, heel, and the heel, right? Bottom round, eye round, and heel. Let's get these bones out of here. Let me just put them over the side. So far this is my unusable pile. I'm going to throw that in the tub. This is somewhat usable. Make sure there's no large tendons or connectives. Even if I'm going to grind it, I want to minimize large connective tissues. What's the good fat to lean ratio for hamburger? 80 20 is typical, right? So um, that's what we're doing here. We're developing a basic fat to lean ratio. In a large meat processing plant, they actually take sample tests of it and they put it in a little cooker that cooks it down to test the fat to lean ratio when they're doing their grinds. Large meat processing plant, the one that I saw uh, was grinding 500 pounds a minute. <laughs> it was moving. There's <laughs> a giant mixer hopper. You know, they, they were taking what they call all their bench trimmings, all of this stuff and grinding it. Today there's a lot of regulation on that. Um, they have to be very cautious because of E. coli. Because you're taking all these animals and mixing them together and grinding it. And if one has the E. coli on the outside somewhere, some kind of contaminant, then it could get into the middle of the hamburger. Where does E. coli come from? Duty. <laughs> Yes, it is from fecal matter, primarily, which might be on the outside of the carcass. Um, and it's primarily uh, from that. It's not from something that's in the meat. It's not like, uh, 
the trachina parasite or anything like that. Um, it's it's an exterior thing, so it can be cleaned off. If you're buying whole muscle cut, you trim the outside a little bit, and you're in good shape as far as E. coli is concerned. You, you don't have much chance of it. What does USCA say to cook hamburger to? 155. 50. I hate hamburger cooked that. That's well done. 155 is well done. I like my hamburger well. Medium rare. So how do you cook a hamburger to medium rare? Grind your own whole muscle cut and put it on the menu. We buy whole muscle cut. We cook to, you know, whatever temperature you like. And when you handle it, you treat it like a ready-to-eat item. You know what I mean? All right, that's the eye round. This is the heel. Anyone ever hear of the heel before this? No, heel is not like your major, a major cut. It's not something that, you know, it's not marketed. ShopRite, on special, heels. <laughs> And then this would be the bottom round, or what we call the bottom round flat. So I've taken a large primal cut. I've turned it into what? Subprimals. Sub Are these HRI cuts? No. What? Can a restaurant buy a top round? Yes. yes. Can a restaurant buy an eye round? Yes. yes. Can a restaurant buy a shank? Yes. yes. So they are HRI cuts. But I can further trim them into other HRI cuts. Right? So HRI is kind of like a, a more of a general term than subprime. Subprime would be a specific cut. HRI cut would be that specific cut or that specific cut trimmed into a further configuration. Got that? So don't be confused. What if I cut it into a portion? Then it's a different thing again, and it's a portion. So that's the bottom round, or what's known as the bottom round flat. So we've taken our round of beef, and this is the heel. We can turn this into stew cubes tomorrow. We can turn this into some stew cubes tomorrow. We'll turn these into a variety of different roasts tomorrow. <coughs> what are we going to do with these? Soup bones. Cut them up. And take the marrow bones and sell them for more. All right? As a chef, you see, you see the difficulty of buying a whole large piece. The likelihood of it is low. But as a chef, you look at these individual pieces, they're much more manageable, all right? So this is basically where we start as far as your fabrication is concerned. I like to show you the whole thing. It was my input this, so that you would see where everything comes from and see the differences between them um, and kind of what, what it's all about. Um, so you realize what's in every component. So you pretty much see the whole side of beef. Uh, you're not going to see that much of the chuck. You'll see the shoulder clod from the chuck, but you'll get some of that as well. All right? So that's today's demo. Um, and pretty much today's lesson. Uh, today was primarily a lecture demo day, and then tomorrow will be production. Tomorrow's day, we need to label this cart AM1, and we're going to use these uh, parts tomorrow. Each team, each class is going to have their cart. All right? And then we'll wheel this back in tomorrow as well as uh, do some shoulder cuts. Yes? Are we allowed to put butcher's aprons in here or is it just the four-way? I think that you're, do you have a butcher's apron? I have.